there are 25 different titles for right. Antichrist That's in right. Revelation. 25? 25. He's called the man of sin, the lawless one. You can just go right through and and um, all of these titles are meant to give us a little glimpse into his character, his personality. He is the most wicked, most awful person. I mean, take Hitler and Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong and all those people, yeah. wrap them all up to one and then multiply them and you won't even come close to the awful uh, character of this man. And he's going to gain control of this world and everyone will be under his domination because if they aren't, they won't be able to function. So David, our audience curiosity, my curiosity is, um, where does this man come from? What can you tell us about us, about him, based on biblical revelation? All right. I believe he comes out of the European coalition. The Bible says that early in his, in his uh, career, he takes power over three nations, and then with those three nations, he gets power over the European mm -hmm. coalition, and then ultimately he comes to power over all the world. And uh, when we talk about the false prophet in a few moments, you'll learn that his, his uh, strategy for gaining control of the world is to provide a license for everybody to basically be alive. Uh, we call it the mark of the beast, but basically this license was set up to control the economy of the world and, and the, way, the way you qualified to be able to eat and sell and buy and all of that was to worship the beast, mm -hmm. who is the Antichrist, the beast from the sea. And so there, that's where we get the mark of the beast, and, and uh, he, he gain, gains control over all the world. Uh, here's the key thing that he does. He makes a covenant with Israel at the beginning of his career, and he promises to protect them from all of their Arabic enemies. And, 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 okay. and so Israel goes back home, and they, they kind of disarm. They use all of their inventiveness mm -hmm. and try to rebuild their economy. Yeah. And the Bible says while they're at peace, he comes in and he breaks the covenant that he had made with them. So the peace treaty is is is, is negated. At it's the end over. of three and a half years, he comes in and he violates their temple. He comes in and he destroys. He see when he makes the covenant, he says, "You can continue your worship." At the end of the three and a half years, he says, "That's it, no more. I'm going to be worshipped now. You you don't worship anymore." And in, in what the Bible calls the the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist actually goes into the Jewish temple. I mean, this is hard to comprehend. He goes into the Holy of Holies. He removes all the furniture and he sets up a statue in the Holy of Holies, which is an idol unto himself. Mm. And he requires the whole earth to bow down and worship. What degree of persecution does, uh, does Antichrist uh, empower? You know, it's interesting. This is a very insightful question because it's not just all uh, overt persecution. Just stop and think about it for a moment. If you can't buy and you can't sell, you can't, pretty soon you don't have any food. And my, my belief is that many of the people during the tribulation are going to die from starvation because there won't be any way, they will not be able to participate in the economy of the world and they won't be able to eat. And so little by little, they will, they will, they'll die. So we embody the most cruel of, of, of uh, leaders empowered by Satan. Satan. Yeah. who has now assumed control of the world. Right. Just as God has a trinity, Satan has a trinity, right. an unholy trinity. Uh, Satan re responds to God the Father, the Antichrist responds to God the Son, and the false prophet responds to God the Holy Spirit. So you've got an unholy trinity empowered by Satan, and their purpose is to do evil at its greatest ever. Unpack a little bit about this false prophet. Is it a is it uh, someone with a theological background? Uh, well, someone who's seen as a religious type figure. I mean, there are all yeah, kinds of theories. Sure, right. But his whole purpose is not religious. His the religious leader, the false prophet, really becomes the economic czar under the le under the rulership of the Antichrist, and he manages. He's religious, and he's the religious leader and the economic leader, and he's the one who enforces the mark of the beast. He's the one who causes everybody to bow down to the Antichrist. He's the worship leader, really. Oh. He makes them worship the Antichrist, and if they don't, they don't get a mark. If they if they have a mark, they've already capitulated to worship the beast. Something's got to happen here. Right. What happens? Well, the first thing that happens is the Antichrist is now in control and he can ultimately finally do what he wants to do. He's going to march against Israel and wipe them off of the earth. What um, the uh, former president of Iran said he wanted to do, the Antichrist will now determine to do. 
He will march Ahmed with Ahmadinejad. Yeah, right. Yeah. He will march toward. He will march toward Israel, and then all of a sudden he'll begin to start hearing things that are happening. Mm. Other armies are coming toward him from the north, from the south. Uh, Eastern armies coming across the Euphrates River, and he has to stop for a moment and try to deal with that. Well, he does, and to, to kind of fast forward as quickly as we can, all of a sudden, all of these armies are together, and there is a new opponent that they weren't apparently aware, aware of. The Lord Jesus Christ comes back, mm -hmm. and these enemies that were fighting each other now have a common opponent. So they all come together to fight against Jesus Christ in what we call the Battle of Armageddon. I've seen where that's going to take place yes, in right. Israel. It's the most marvelous battlefield you've ever seen. Right. But all of a sudden, all these armies are together, and Jesus Christ comes back. And so the Antichrist leads the armies of the world against Jesus Christ, and the Bible tells us that Christ comes back with his holy ones and with all the angels, and Christ, by the breath of his mouth, I tell our people when I preach this, he goes, yeah. and all the rebellious people of the earth are destroyed. And it's such a great destruction that the 19th chapter of Revelation says, God has to summon the birds of the air from all over the earth to come and clean up the carnage that's created. Is that scene there at Armageddon, is that what we refer to as the apocalypse? Is that that apocalyptic that, moment? What, that that's right. That's when Jesus Christ is finally ultimately revealed to the whole. That's the apocalypse, the revealing of Jesus. All right. So Jesus comes, destroys uh, Antichrist, takes down the uh, uh, takes down the weaponry, takes away all the allies, everything, the coalitions all fall apart. What happens then next according to the Word of God? All, all of those who have rebelled against the Lord are destroyed. The only people left on this earth are people who are believers in Christ or followers of Christ. Right. The, um, the carnage is cleaned up and Jesus Christ comes and he sets up his kingdom on this earth. It's called the millennium, which is a word which is easy to remember. It's made out of two words, mill, which means a thousand, and annum, which means year. So right. the millennium is a thousand years. Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom on this earth, and all those who are followers of him are there. And the Bible says those of us who lived and uh, were raptured will be with him and will help him administrate what goes on during the millennium, and King David will be his vice regent. Wow. And it's going to be, that's one of my favorite chapters because Everything that was in Eden and was destroyed by the fall now comes back, and, and it's even better. But then there is the biblical revelation right. Right. of Jesus Christ, the judge. Right. And uh, there, is a, there, there are several judgments in the Bible, but this one you refer to, is it the great white throne right. judgment? Just as there are no unbelievers at the judgment seat of Christ, there are no believers at the great white throne. All unbelievers of all time will stand before the judge of all the earth and give an account oh. of themselves. And the Bible says, and the books will be opened, and they will be judged out of the books. And the books aren't listed in the book of Revelation, but if you read the scripture carefully, you begin to pick up on some of them. Uh, there's, there's the book of their life, what they did with their life, their words, their conscience. But the most important book is the book of life. And the Bible says, in Revelation chapter 20, and if their name is not found written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire and, and suffer forever and ever. So there is the future of ones who do not know Christ. Right. What about the future of Satan, uh, this horrible, terrible, harassing, mm -hmm. accusing creature? Well, let me tell you about Satan and his, and his buddies. At the end of the tribulation, at the, at the Battle of Armageddon, the false prophet and the beast are cast into Hades. That's what the Bible says, right? I'm just, I'm just telling you what the scripture sure. says right there. Sure. Then a thousand years happens, Satan's still there. He's bound, but he's not been cast into the lake of fire yet. Yeah. At the end of the, of, of the millennium, the Bible says he joins his two buddies in the lake of fire. They actually are in health for a thousand years before he is and they become the first inhabitants of hell. And the Bible says those who have rejected Christ and have followed Satan in his ways, who have taken the mark of, of the beast in order that they might escape the judgment, they will be cast into that lake of fire along with Satan and the false prophet and the beast. 
And that's a very uh, uncomfortable yeah. thing for people to say. But I like to remind everybody that if God did not do that, he couldn't be God. If God could passively stand by and watch the evil that we're beginning to see, even in our world today, and do nothing, he would disqualify himself as the God of the earth. He must do right. And even though we, we know he does right with love and mercy and justice, he also does right with judgment. And at the end, his judgment will be poured out. Then what happens? Then the Bible says this is, a, this is just, it's, you know, it's momentous. It's just yeah, the kingdom, breathtaking. The Bible says that the kingdom of our of our Lord will be delivered unto the Father. The, the whole if you read the, the stories and Dwight Pentecost says there's more in the Bible about the millennium than any other subject in prophecy. If you read all of the Old and New Testament scriptures about the millennium and the and the beauty of it, and yeah. I think in my chapter I have like 10 or 11 characteristics of the millennium. People live to be old. They have children uh, when they're 100 years old and there's no death and there's no sickness. And the millennium is just this pristine thing that yeah. in, in the back of our mind yeah. we, we yeah. look for. Yeah. That's just going to be extended for eternity. And it's called heaven. God has a plan and it's laid out for us in the scriptures. Some of it is dark, but in every dark place there's always a parenthesis of his grace and mercy. God never leaves us without a witness, even during the tribulation. He sends 144,000 people and two mega witnesses sure. to this dark earth because of his love and, and his compassion for people. If you don't get to heaven, it won't be because God doesn't want you there. He's done everything he knows how to do, everything that can be done, including giving his own begotten son to pay the penalty Sorry. for your sin and mine. So when you stand before the Lord someday and he says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? I hope you'll be prepared to say, because I received your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as my savior and my substitute, and he has promised me the gift of eternal life. And if you haven't done that, wherever you are as you watch this and listen to this, the whole purpose of this is not to make you smarter about Revelation, but to help you know that God loves you, that Christ died for you, that he paid a way for you to go to heaven. And you have to make your reservation in the here and now because after you die, it will be too late. Is it appointed unto man once to die and after that, the judgment.